And for more on this story, let's bring in Paul Melia, consulting fellow of the Africa program at Chatham House. Uh, thanks for being with us again here on France 24. You know, you and I spoke not long ago about the military coup in yeah. Niger. Are the events we're seeing unfold in Gabon different in any important way? I mean, how should we be thinking about this? I think they are really different. Uh, one of the things that's very striking in Gabon is this is a long-standing family dynasty, as your report just explained. And for many Gabonese, there was a frustration, a sense that although elections were held regularly, basically the result was prefixed in advance. Uh, they didn't really have a political choice. They had the freedom to speak out. They had the freedom to comment. They had a choice of political parties, but they couldn't actually really change their government, change the people who ruled them. And so a small elite, the Bongo family and a sort of wider political and administrative class around them have monopolized uh, not just the leadership of the country, but if you like, um, the way resources are distributed over many, many decades. We'd, that's a very different situation from Niger, where um, the, the president who's been deposed, Mohamed Bazoum, was only elected for the first time in 2021. And his party, um, because he succeeded someone from the same party, hadn't come to power till 2011. So it's a very, very different type of situation. As we just saw there in that report, we were seeing these images of people celebrating in, in Libreville. I wonder what you make of that. Are, are people celebrating because they perceive this as the end of a corrupt family dynasty, as you just made reference to? Well, I think it's whether it, whether it's corrupt, fully corrupt, of course, we will wait to learn from the investigations and uh, information, sort of full revelation about exactly how the system was organized. But the, but the point is the system had become tired. Not only did Ali Bongo's father, Omar Bongo, rule for more than four decades, but then in 2009, when, when Omar Bongo died and there was an election, um, Ali Bongo emerged as the winner from that election in very opaque circumstances. Many people actually think that the main rival candidate had actually won. Then in 2016, there was another election uh, where, again, there was a lot of opacity or a lot of questions over the credibility of the result. And then again, uh, the election whose results were announced uh, in the very early hours of yesterday morning, a very strange time to announce an election result. Again, that there were big questions over the conduct of that poll. So people sort of feel tired. They felt they didn't have much choice. And they felt that Ali Bongo had already served 14 years in power, two seven-year terms. He'd suffered a stroke, so uh, a major health problem in 2018. And many people wondered, was it reasonable that he should be running for a third term? Why, why couldn't they have an alternative choice, a wider sort of meaningful prospect of change. Of course, there were, were opposition candidates and there was um, one leading opposition candidate who got 30% of the, in, according to those official results, but nobody ever seriously thought that he would be allowed to win. So I think people were just sort of tired by the system and felt that um, Gabon with its rich natural resources, its oil, um, its uh, other, its minerals, its rich rainforest, uh, ought to be able to deliver a better development result for the population. Right, as you point out, Gabon is an oil-rich country. Is there a sense that that prosperity has not been passed down to everyday people who've, who've been living under the rule of the Bongo family for more than five decades? Uh, yes, there's, there's a lot of social inequality. There's a feeling that uh, essentially it's not just the Bongo family, but the wider elite class were very well looked after, if you like, by the regime. But ordinary people did not get the level of public services or the level of income that they could reasonably have expected. Gabon has a very small population, uh, only one or two million. Um, and yet there are serious social problems. There are serious development shortcomings. Um, one of the major development agencies a few years ago produced a report which assessed that relative to the resources available, 
Gabon had one of the worst development returns of any country in Africa. And uh, so that's where people feel that there were missed opportunities, that the system could have been run so much better. Of course, in any society, you'll have inequality. But there was a feeling that um, the development return for ordinary Gabonese and for the very large migrant population in Gabon was not as good as it could have been, given the resources that the country has. Okay, we'll have to leave it there. Paul Melly, Consulting Fellow of Africa Program at Chatham House. Always good to talk to you. Thanks for being with us here on France 24. Cool.